first we're going to have Sam Ohugan III, who's worked with the, for over 40 years in conservation biology and is a senior scientist and cultural advisor for the Nature Conservancy of Hawaii. Um, then Kevin Chang, who's the co-director with Miwa Tamanaha of Kua Aina Ulu Awamo Kua, a nonprofit organization with a mission to increase the capacity of community-based resource management initiatives with the vision of Aina Mamona. And last but not least, we'll have Jack Kittinger. Dr. Kittinger is the Senior Director of the Global Fisheries and Aquaculture Program and Conservation International Center for Oceans and a Professor of Practice in Arizona State University's Global Futures Laboratory and School of Sustainability. So I actually realized I'd never introduced myself. I'll be the moderator. I'm McKenna Kaufman um, with the University of Hawaii at Manoa Institute for Sustainability and Resilience. Uh, with that, I will pass it over to you, Sam. Cool. <laughs> You can hope you will not get an no ya to a yee, to a low I started with my favorite forest entrance chant because we live in a singularly remarkable place, an archipelago posting more ecological diversity in one specific location than any other place on earth. And I've had the great honor and joy of exploring this diversity from end to end of that, of our Pacific Island chain. That same dynamic biotic richness also meant awesome opportunities for our Hawaiian ancestors who arrived in the islands about a thousand years ago, where they thrived in isolation in the middle of the Pacific, achieving population densities rivaling those of today, yet entirely independent from the rest of the world creating one of the pinnacles of Polynesian societies and achieving a remarkably small human footprint while enjoying sustained, self-sufficient abundance. Recapturing the best of that island sustainability is at the heart of what is called biocultural conservation, a progressive approach to conservation that recognizes and honors the intrinsic relationships between nature and humanity and builds conservation efforts that are not only based in the best available science, but grounded in cultural knowledge, values, and practices, and aligned with community priorities. Instead of viewing people as separate from nature, this people in nature approach can lead to more long-term success because it involves the communities connected to the natural resources of concern and builds a broad constituent of support for conservation. Recently, Kavika Winter and I co-authored an article in American Scientists suggesting that Hawaii shows huge potential as a model for world sustainability and how this model via the Hawaiian Renaissance is now extending into the realm of conservation. Emerging biocultural lessons include recognizing the necessity of land sea connections in conservation, affirming the importance of place-based expertise of communities, taking advantage of knowledge networks that inform the whole, integrating economy and society with ecosystem health and imposing necessary restrictions guided by the health of those ecosystems. And a shout out to my fellow panelist, Kelvin, Kevin Chang, who you'll hear from shortly, who was one of the guest editors of a special issue of the journal Sustainability that was devoted entirely to biocultural restoration in Hawaii. It underscores that the biocultural approach is a growing movement toward melding culture and conservation powerfully. And as a conservation biologist and a Hawaiian cultural practitioner, I maintain hope that a changing world does not equate to inevitable loss of all that we value, but that we move toward a future where people and nature enjoy co-prosperity through a renewed connection of reciprocal relationships ones that were second nature to our Hawaiian ancestors, and that can be reforged in this time of global pandemic, when we're forced to break out of business as usual and reassess what is truly important for the future, both here in Hawaii and the world. Uh, but just kind of, kind of building on what Sam said, I think a foundation of what he just talked about is people, is people, is people. And I work for an organization called Kua Aina Ulu Awamo, which means grassroots, growing through shared responsibility. Our acronym Kua means backbone. We were created by the communities we serve. Uh, we serve to facilitate and connect communities 
uh, what we call Opili, to bring them together to build a spirit of governance and civic and citizen stewardship around taking care of our environment and each other. Uh, our founding network is called Ealupu, which means move forward together. Um, those communities have a very broad vision around Aina Momona, touching on what Sam talked about in terms of uh, Mauka to Makai, uh, mountain to ocean, um, care for Hawaii. Uh, and today we, we are now a team of 10. I'm a co-director along with Miwa Tamanaha, and we serve three networks. The other two networks are the Hui Malama Lokoia, a group of uh, fish pond kiai, uh, helping tell the story of indigenous aquaculture to our own community and to the world. And uh, our third network is the Limuhui, which is a group of uh, elders, uh, mostly elders, founded by elders, uh, quickly expanding around folks who gather and um, uh, are learning to actually uh, bring back our native seaweeds and kind of tackle and tackle the questions together as to why we're losing them. Uh, just as folks have been tackling the question around why we're losing our native plants in the mountains. Um, so those those three networks really are are what we we exist because of the people basically. Um, I think a, another core part of our work is so we we bring them together, ho'opili, but then we ho'ohui, we we connect them to the resources, relationships that they need to make to change the context in which they work. So the idea is we bring them together, they build a spirit of governance, they build the confidence to begin changing that context. They reach out, begin to influence, learn from and teach the partners they need to take Hawaii to a better, uh, a higher level of care. And not only do they do that with each other, with the government, at the municipal and the state level, but today they are reaching out to the world, touching again on what Sam said about uh, how Hawaii can be an example for the world. Um, and I think our community can do that. And I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Mahalo, Kevin. Jack. Thank you, McKenna. And let me just say it's an honor to be here with you and with Sam and Kevin and with all the folks tuning in across the Paiaina. I work with Conservation International and have had the um, wonderful experience of having uh, been part of the conservation sector here in Hawaii for over a decade. And one of the things that I've been working on lately that I think is uh, unique and could solve a lot of our conservation challenges is the need for dedicated conservation financing. Um, as Sam and Kevin have indicated, uh, we as an archipelago have a model of sustainability, but if what we also have is a 200 year plus legacy of colonial practices that have eroded the integrity of our ecosystems and impacted our communities so heavily. Fortunately for us, there are a number of geographies that also hold solutions that we can look to, to um, reverse that decline. And there are incredible initiatives all across our archipelago to do just that. But what they lack is long-term secure sources of funding to support these efforts in perpetuity. It is a constant challenge for our practitioner community who has to fight and scrap and push as hard as they can to get the resources they need to save these ecosystems, these cultural practices, and the natural resources upon which we all rely. In 2018, the Philippines uh, closed this island called Boraki. Uh, it had become overused by the tourists that were visiting this island, millions of tourists. And it immediately, that closed down, which was predicated on the fact that the, the trash and the waste from the overuse had piled up and it had overtaxed the island's capacity to absorb the tourist impact. And it immediately put 17,000 people out of work. Now that's a lesson uh, that we need to heed. We are not Boraki and we don't wanna be Boraki. Um, we have incredible resources that are still intact, but we are testing the limits of our natural built and social infrastructure with our visitor industry. And it just so happens over the past year, we've had one of the most unnatural experiments in our history with respect to tourism, which is that last year we had a record 10 million visitors, which dropped to almost zero 
overnight when the pandemic happened. Um, our communities have been uh, greatly stressed by both the impacts of over-tourism pre-pandemic and now post-pandemic uh, and in the middle of it, we have all the economic crises that come with the lack of that revenue across our communities and the vanishing of jobs that have supported so many folks here. Um, right now in Hawaii, there are about $500 uh, million dollars per year that go into conservation. Now that's a lot of money. That's a half a billion dollars. That is a lot of money. Uh, but the problem is, is that we need probably somewhere on the order of 900 million per year minimum to keep pace with the challenges that we face from global climate change and also, also just from the local threats that are in our backyard that we can fully manage if we had the resources to do so. So we have a gap in financing and that puts us at a big disadvantage. And that's partially responsible for why our resource base continues to decline. We're simply not investing in it. Think of it sort of as like an unfunded liability, right? Of the highest magnitude that we could possibly imagine. Right. We talk about unfunded liabilities like pension systems. Well, our natural and biocultural capital is so critical to our communities, and we are underinvesting in it. Um, and we're underinvesting compared to other places that we compete with tourists uh, for. So, poor tourists, the Republic of Palau spends $92 per visitor. Um, New Zealand. Uh, Aotearoa spends about $140 per tourist on their natural resource base. We spend $9 per tourist. So this is not just a problem for communities, it is also a problem for our visitor sector because the reason that visitors come is our incredible ecosystems and our natural beauty and our culture. And we're putting all that at risk. Fortunately, there are places like Palau and the Galapagos that have figured out a way to finance conservation at the requisite scale through visitor green fees. If you visit uh, the Galapagos or Palau after this pandemic is hopefully defeated, you will pay an entry fee of $100. That funding goes into a mechanism, a fund that goes back into communities to fund conservation work. I actually sit on the Palau Protected Area Network Fund board. It's the fund that the visitor green fee goes into. And there are millions of dollars every year from visitors that go into that fund, are invested and grown and go back into communities. We can do this and we should do this. Um, when we had 10 million visitors, a, a $50 per visitor contribution would create 500 million per year. Now, not only would that help save resources and ecosystems and cultural practice, across the islands, it also would create green jobs. And guess what we need right now? Green jobs, a lot of them, especially for young people. Um, so we've got a great opportunity, not only to transform our economy, but to employ folks and to get our natural resource base back on track. Uh, we're working on this. Uh, it's been an initiative that's got a long history as Sam and McKenna and Kevin know. This idea goes back for at least a few decades at this point. We've never had an opportunity to reset tourism and the relationship that our visitor sector has with our islands. And having worked a lot with folks in the visitor sector, uh, which you know is largely staffed by local people, uh, folks in that industry see the same things that folks in our conservation sector see, which is that the pathway we're on does not lead to a good outcome. And what we've seen in other places is that the visitor green feet can actually engender a stronger relationship uh, between tourism and conservation. And not only does it support the visitor experience, but it provides the impetus for visitors to be involved in part of the solution to natural resource challenges in the geographies that we're at. So we're excited about this. We've looked at 14 or 15 different systems across the world, drawn the best practices from those systems that we think could be implemented here. And we hope to be able to pilot something like this in the not too distant future. It's complicated, but it's also quite simple. And it's shown to be something that works in a lot of places that have the same challenges we do. So I'm excited to chat about that and excited to be here as part of this panel with all of you. Thank you. Mahalo, Jack. Thank you to all of you. Those were really great presentations and comments and um, a lot to go on there. And I just wanted to start out with, you know, uh, very powerful ideas of 
Aina Ramona and biocultural conservation. And I'm wondering um, for any of you, but particularly Sam and Kevin who work in this field kind of specifically in that area, can you give some examples of where Aina Ramona has been improved uh, through biocultural conservation practice? In the Ahukwa of He'eia, um, down at the bottom, there's the fish pond, Pai Bayo He'eia. And, uh, and there's also Kane Ohebe, which is a remarkable marine resource. Um, one of the only ecosystems of its type actually in the, in the whole archipelago. Um, and on the juncture of that is the, is the um, Heia National Estuarine Research Reserve that Kagiko Winter is, is heading up the, the programs on. Um, and uh, right adjacent to that uh, estuary is, is Kako'o'o'ivi and Mahuahua Eiohoi, which are attempting to restore um, the, the kalo cultivation that once dominated that section and fed the entire ahuwa and, and by argument, much of the moku of Ko'olau Poko. Um, at that, and at the same time, reduce the sediment going into the ocean by buffering it through uh, an agricultural system creating these uh, semi-natural wetlands that were habitat for endangered water birds, um, and, and then on up through the Ahuwa. So what we're seeing there is the reconstruction of those same relationships of land and sea and people in them, um, working to maintain the relationships and consciously, uh, consciously recognizing what they're doing and why. Um, I have no doubt in my mind that uh, that um, the pre-contact Hawaiian systems were highly observant of, on what their practices, Malka, did to the resources of the estuary and therefore to the fish ponds that were associated to them and the, and the health of the, of the marine ecosystem below. So that's one good example. And, and uh, we have been working at that community-based um, uh, system for a number of years now with the Nature Conservancy and our partners at Kako'o Ivi and Pai Pai Ohe'eia. For you, Kevin, thanks for sharing the link to, um, to the HRS. And I'm wondering if there is any comparable um, law in terms of land-based resource, community-based resource management or efforts to do so. Comparable and that there are communities throughout the state uh, and not in our network who are heavily involved in watershed and forest management. Um, and I think inspired by the community fishery movement, there is a, a growing discussion around creating, uh, and uh, unfortunately they're using the same ac acronym, but community-based subsistence forestry areas. Um, specifically as an example, there's activity going on in Kuvava on, on Hawaii Island, um, though not, not uh, kind of made solid in policy. I think the goal in the long run is for the work they're doing to become something that's more of a policy and not just a localized effort. Jack, what specifically would you spend the green fee you advocate for Hawaii? Um, that's in the chat. And I'll add to that sort of, you know, if you if you had that 400 million in the, the budget gap, annual budget gap that you identified, sort of, you know, what changes could we see? What would be what would be done with that? Well, as much as I'd like to be the benevolent dictator that decides where that funding should go, <laughs> something of this nature would certainly need to be managed by a, um, you know, by a partnership of folks. And as Sam and Kevin have indicated, there are communities across the archipelago um, that would uh, not just be beneficiaries of this sort of a mechanism, but also shape its purpose. And so typically what has happened in other geographies is that the funding is specifically directed towards uh, conservation. So in Palau, um, the only sites that are eligible are in the Palau protected area network. Those are both terrestrial and marine. And um, all you have to do is have a PAN site, that's the acronym, PAN protected area network, uh, which would be sort of equivalent more or less to what these, um, to what Kevin is discussing here with, with respect to community-based subsistence fishing areas and their terrestrial equivalents. Uh, as well as fish ponds and other uh, sites. So um, if we were to get something like this passed into law, the, the law would certainly have to be very specific about what the funding is used for. And typically what has been coming up in our conversations uh, with folks on this is um, 
to simply tie it to the Aloha Plus natural resource management target. Um, and that's a statewide set of sustainability targets that of course, you know, McKenna, you know those well. Uh, our 100% renewable energy uh, goal, for example, is the energy target in that mix. Our natural resource uh, management targets um, focus on getting 30% of our lands and waters into effective management by 2030, um, which would open up, you know, uh, obviously a broad array of initiatives um, that are seeking to manage uh, resources in a place-based fashion, which would sort of cover sort of all those things. That's the conversation thus far, but I think we have to shape this moving forward, but we do have to be very specific that this funding would be used for conservation and biocultural initiatives. And beyond that, we'd have to find a, you know, the right mechanism to help steer and guide the fund as other geographies have done. 